Welcome to Top of Mind, the show where real estate industry insiders talk shop about the big trends shaping the market today. Enjoy the show. Mike Simonson here. Thanks for joining me today. Welcome to the Top of Mind podcast. This is where I talk to the smartest leaders, thinkers, and doers in the real estate industry. The, this episode is brought to you by Altos Research. Each week, Altos Research tracks every home for sale in the country, all the pricing, all the changes in pricing, and we bubble up all that analytics to make it available to you before it becomes visible in the traditional channels. Uh, you can visit altosresearch.com for more information. For a couple of years now, we've been sharing the latest market data in every week in, in, in weekly our weekly video series. With our new Top of Mind podcast, we are looking to add some context to the discussion uh, about what's happening in the market, and we're going to learn from the leaders in the industry. So speaking of leaders in the industry, I am thrilled to announce my guest today, Mark Johnson, who is the CEO of JPAR Real Estate. JPAR is a fast-growing, full-service transaction-based real estate brokerage based in Texas with offices throughout the country. Mark is also the host of Success Superstars, a weekly show that highlights the blueprint of real estate agent success. And he is the co-founder of Co-Recruit. Mark has invested decades in understanding the inner workings of high-performing real estate companies, managers, teams, agents, and we are lucky to have him on the show. Welcome, Mark. Well, Mike, thank you for that gracious introduction. And first, I want to thank you for, for what you're contributing to the industry. You know, I use your reports daily and the Altos uh, research uh, reports and the podcasts and the videos that you do are valuable to us as, as leading our firms. That's terrific. I am so glad that uh, we get to work together. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so, you know, we talk about, I talk about the data a lot and a lot, you know, the Altos videos are me talking out. Uh, it, there's a lot of experience in this industry and and I want to share it. I want to learn it and share it. And so um, I've got some, let's talk about the, the market and let's talk first, before we dive into market stuff, for listeners who don't know JPAR, why don't you give them a quick overview? Tell us about it and tell us about the company and why it's awesome. Yeah, well, it's so awesome uh, to be here and to have that opportunity. So JPAR is a full service transaction fee brokerage, and we're founded on three values of integrity, productivity, and service. Our per person productivity is approaching you know, 10 transactions a year, which is right up there, uh, an industry leading uh, stat. The other thing that we're really known for is influential industry leaders. You know, We empower, we teach, we train, and we give back to our communities. And, and so it's just an amazing culture of like-minded folks that want to serve the consumer at the highest level and give back to our local communities. That's really great. So 10 transactions av average per, per agent? Yeah, depending on the location where you are. That's great. And, and so um, are you, and, and obviously you invest a lot of training. So a lot of um, uh, real estate firms are, you know, the broker is designed to just be there as a structure and knock yourself out. And, and a lot of agents in the industry don't sell many properties at all. How um, do you organize your training and your, your resources for agent? Like, uh, is it about transaction volume or like productivity per agent? Well, see, it's so funny. You follow the money, right? You've, you've heard this in so many movies, right? Or whatever, follow the money. See, what's so beautiful about the transaction-based model is we don't make a dime unless someone sells something, right? If, if someone makes a big sale, we make the same amount, whether they make a big sale or a little sale. So it's about transaction volume and productivity. And since all of our interests are commonly aligned, that has a powerful combination of creating productivity and service in each of our local markets. That's great. So, um, and, and, uh, and what are the big markets that you're in? You're based in Texas, but you're all over the country. Where, where do you have most of your effort? Yeah, we're, we're in uh, 26 states and growing, you know, soon to be 50. But, but the firm was founded here in Dallas, Texas, in, in Frisco, which is our largest market at the moment. 
uh, and that's those are company owned stores all along the 35 down through Austin, San Antonio, over to El Paso and up to Midland. We have a very large and successful franchisee in Houston, the Sears Group, and th they're doing very, very well. And then franchisee owners all across uh, the United States outside of Texas. Got so, it. That's great. How many total agents? 3,500 and growing. Awesome. Uh, that's exciting. Yeah. Um, okay. So the podcast is called Top of Mind. What's top of mind for you right now? It's November, we're heading into the end of the year, 2021. It's been a nuts year. What's top of mind for you? Yeah, Mike, what a great question. There's so many things top of mind, but the two that come to mind is for consumers, it's never been more important in this market to work with the real estate professional. And two, for the real estate professional, it's never been more important to realize we may have to work two times as hard, three times as hard, five times as hard to get the same level of effort. Because as you know, the inventory has shrunk. And that is making a very, very challenging market for even the most experienced profession, much less the newer profession. Yeah. So, um, so uh, it's, you say it's important for consumers more than ever to work with a profession. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of tech trends and consumers like to be able to interface with their app. And there's a lot of uh, companies who are trying to get the agent out of the space. Why do you, what, what makes you say it's more important than ever? Well, let me give you an example. I have three millennials, uh, three millennial sons. Two of my three became first time homeowners in October. Now, out of the 71 million millennials, which is a big friend we had a trend we had to talk about, that's top of mind to me. Uh, but uh, of my two millennials who bought in October, they valued their real estate professional. Yes, they used the technology to ease communication, to uh, make the transaction smoother. But they would not have done that transaction without the local, knowledgeable, hyper-local expert who helped them navigate through all kinds of myriad of, of things. I was an observer. I was the dad, you know, going on the showings and uh, you know, being that dad with these agents. And it was amazing the relationship uh, they they developed. And now my oldest son uh, fired his first agent, uh, and uh, finally was very satisfied with his second agent. But the the first agent was not meeting his needs, and he needed a professional who could help him navigate the first time home buyer experience. That's fascinating. So, uh, you know, I remember when I bought my first home twenty some years ago. Like, I just had some random agent that somebody introduced me for, introduced me to. Um, what what kind of thing, like, makes makes uh, a buyer f fire their agent? Well, I call it they have commission breath. Uh -huh. <laughs> their their presentation needs a mint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. And, and so it's easy. And you, you and I have been around the block a few times. We know when someone's trying to sell us something versus when someone's trying to be a consultant uh, to us. Right. So his first agent was really salesy. And his second agent was more of a consultant trying to understand his needs and, and solve his problem with various solutions in the marketplace. Right. It's the kind I, I, I think I get it. It's like, um, uh, you know, if if it feels like there's pressure for me to do a transaction that I don't quite feel ready for or isn't quite right for me, it's a big difference between a, a buyer's agent who says, uh, who says, like maybe even things like, "This one probably isn't right for you," or right. "Let's take." And that's a that's a really fascinating difference. And his second agent did that, where the first agent didn't. So there's a difference for the sales professional listening to us. There's a difference between pressure. And persistence. Yeah. Persistence is different because when you're persistent, maybe my son needed to hear the story told a different way or maybe uh, a different solution where the first one was just putting pressure. Right. The second one was persistent, but could adapt and had maybe a higher EQ, maybe. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. I remember I bought, uh, I have a, a ski house in the mountains and I told my agent when. I hired her. I, I said, um, uh, I'm going to look for a long time. 
Uh-huh. And uh, and if you're okay with that, like then we can do it. And and ultimately, I think I looked at 25 homes before I made an offer. And I remember uh, one that was uh, was like lower. It was less expensive per square foot, for example, than the, than the competitive ones. Uh, and I went to look, and it had the reason it was is a, in the mountains, and it had this big steep driveway. And my agent said, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> and, and I'm so grateful that I didn't, you know, that I didn't do it. And it's also something I think about now. It's like, there's no technology uh, that makes that, there's not enough data in the data, that, like the, the machine learning to know that steep driveway means that even when the plow comes, you you're gonna not be able to take your trash cans out because you're gonna wind up, you know, sixty feet down the ravine. <laughs> there's that. There's just certain things that com- humans are more adapt at that computers never will. Yeah, that's uh, fascinating. Yeah, and so Mike, I guess the other thing that's top of mind to me besides seventy one million millennials is there's seventy three million baby boomers, ten thousand a day according to AAG, are turning 60 every day. Every one of your audience may have heard of what they call a reverse mortgage, but many of them haven't heard of what they call a reverse purchase. It's a very unique product uh, for that age group that could be very powerful and a distinguishing factor for agents uh, moving forward. Tell me about that. What is a reverse purchase? Well, basically, you you know the concept of uh, of a reverse mortgage. This is a way they can basically a do a, a purchase using the same product. We'll have to get one of the oh. AAG professionals on your show to, to kind of go through it. I, I'll connect you with them because they can explain a lot better than I do, but it's That's interesting. So this take. would be a product for seniors, people yeah. retiring. 62 and over. 62 and over. And they are buying their snowbird house. Yep, they, they've sold. They've sold. Let's say their the family home, and they're moving into their retirement home. Well, they can do that with the reverse purchase, huh. and it's, no, nobody knows about it. It's a fascinating product, and could could help generate, um, uh, you know, a, a great opportunity for for some folks that that just may not know about it. And is that like um, that allows them to get equity out? It allows. It, it could allow them to buy more house than maybe they they think they could uh, typically afford. It, it, it could do all kinds of things. It, Interesting. Course, yeah, yeah, you know, obviously in conjunction with their CPA and their financial planner, they have to go through it. But it's it's certainly something in the tool bag. You know, in this market, Mike, I, I think as you know, with with limited inventory, you have to have every tool in your tool bag uh, th- that could potentially help a consumer. And the more tools you have, the more likely you are going to be able to solve that consumer's problem. Yeah. So speaking of that, so, okay, the, the, there's been a lot of financial innovation in the space. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't heard of reverse purchases before, but I imagine that they are uh, a a function. You know, it was really to my mind, it started when open door launched, you know, their, Mm. their buying, their eye buying program and open door wasn't really a technology play. It was a financial innovation play. They had lots of cash, very cheap, and it's very easy for them to go buy homes quickly. Um, <clears throat> are there other trends like that in the financial space that, there you, are, that are really important or interesting to you? It, it is interesting. Now, we've partnered with a firm called Zavi, and we've wrapped a thing called J. Par Sure Sale around it. Uh, as you know, about 90% of consumers want to sell their home traditionally with a real estate professional the way we normally sell. But there's 10% of them that either for certainty or convenience want to swap it as easy as a car or uh, have it bought for them. Now, the, the, I'm confused by all of it, and the real estate confu- agent is really confused. So by partnering with Zavi, what they're doing is taking inventory of all these different companies, all the different offerings, and providing a concierge service for the real estate professional so they can make sense of all this stuff and stay in the transaction. We've labeled it JPAR Sure Sale. You can check it out at jparsuresale.com. But but Zavi helps us consolidate all, you know, everyone has their different buy box and a different 
market they're in and some are in these markets and some are in those markets. And it's enough to make your head spin. Zavi spends all day keeping all this stuff straight. Got it. So Zavi is a tool for your agents to work with home sellers to understand the differences between high buyers and, and, you know, and if it's a, if it's two months ago or three months ago and they say, well, Zillow is overpaying compared to open doors, Zavi would have told your sellers that. Yeah. And so they could, uh, they can, they can be more of a consultant with the seller to say, here's the advantage of selling traditionally and, and the financial result of that. Here's the home swap and what that might look like. And if that works and, and then here's the I buy and let the consumer uh-huh. 90% of them want to sell it traditionally. Right. But there are those few for whatever reason in their um their current need, you know, they they want to, you know, maybe take the haircut and do an eye buy. Yeah. And, and the, agent, the agent can stay in the middle and earn a commission. Yeah, that's neat. Okay. So um are your agents now um like are in your transactions, when you look at the transaction volume for J Par. Um, how influential are the iBuyers? buyers? Are they are they are they are they, are they doing a significant number of transactions? Let, let less than ten percent, and and it's it creates a lot of noise. It creates a lot of buzz uh, because it's different and new, but but it's fairly fairly small. And when you think about it, and you back into the need of a consumer, let me give an example. When I was first selling, I won't tell you the date. <laughs> Way back when. One of my sellers came to me. Uh, this was in Southern California, and she got engaged to a guy in Atlanta. And she wanted that house sold. At all, she wanted to do was cover her mortgage. She didn't care about anything other than getting to her wedding. Yeah. So her financial view, and of course, we counseled her to say, "Wait a minute, you're being a little short sighted here. You can make a little bit more money." But, but you get the point. Her need was not about her house. Her need was to get out of town. Yep, it was and transaction so- speed. Transaction speed, it was convenience and certainty so she could go yep. start her new life. And so some people are in that situation um, and, and that, you know, not be the situation that you and I are in, but it could be what they're in. And so with products like this, we can be a better consultant for those people. Yes. Okay. That's really terrific. Um, and then, um, uh, so, you know, it's interesting that, that the, the iBuyers like were a financial innovation. Uh, a product of having ultra cheap money everywhere in the world. Um, uh, are there, there, and there are some other offshoots of that, like uh, things that, that the, that buyers can use um, in that world. Are there any of those that you are find that are finding uh, particularly useful for your buyers? No. Um, ones that you one, think one are of the ones, one of the ones that we're finding having the most success, success with is knock the knock home swap where, uh, a seller uh, wants to buy, particularly, let's say, a new build. And sometimes the new builds might be six, seven months out. Uh-huh. Well, they can come in non-contingent um, and wait out while they're waiting. And then when they're ready, the home is built and they're ready to move, then not comes in, does the swap, the agent gets the listing, gets the house market ready, and off it goes. And so they can sell and buy at the same time. Got it. So what they do, so what the buyer does with knock with this with this transaction is the buyer or the se- they're they're selling and buying is what they're doing at the same right. time, right? I'm I'm selling my current house, buying it, maybe a, a new construction or a new house. And um and I it's a competitive market, so uh having an all cash offer is valuable. All but normally cash. I couldn't have all cash until I sell my house. No. So, so knock gives me the cash to buy the new house. Mm-hmm. And then, and then we have a contract to sell the old one. Is that how that works? Yeah. In six months. So you have about a six month window, which in this market, as you know, every home's going to sell. Uh, yeah. In six months. So it's super cool product. Check it out at knock.com. Uh, very, very viable uh, uh, offering. And it's probably the biggest out of all these alternative offerings of the ones our agents are having the biggest success with and the most leverage is the knock home store. Is knock. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, Sean Black, the founder of knock, I, I, um, I'll have to get him on the podcast and talk to him about it. He, he would be great on the podcast and his team has really, uh, I think, uh, exceeded expectations in servicing the consumer and the agent. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I have a lot of respect for what they're doing. That's terrific. That's really neat. Um, and uh, are you? Is that a product that's happening in all st- all the states, or are they? No, and see, that's one of the challenges that's hard for agents to keep track of because each of these offerings, you know, that they're in, let's say, ten markets or twelve markets or these, mar- they're all trying to expand to all of them. But right, uh, all of these have they have different buy boxes and they have different markets they're in. So for the average uh, agent. And the average consumer, it's just confusing. And yes. that's where you need someone uh, like we found with Savvy who can help us kind of, all they do is kind of keep all this stuff straight and who works where and who does what and what their buy box is or isn't. Uh, and it, it's 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 the real deal. It's real tricky. Yeah, that's it's fascinating. They, um, uh, they're like, some of these are big trends. And, and the iBuyers, I thought, I think... Um, sort of threaten to change the landscape some. It does appear like there's, it seems like there's a limit to the, how big that they can go. In in the same way, it feels to me like there's a limit to the way discount brokers can go. Like you can be a discount broker. Some people want to cut the fees as low as possible, but most people want the full service. And, um, and, And so it seems like, you know, and most people are okay to pay Full commission price for full service. Um, yeah, depending, it's it's still why I think we have Nordstrom's and we have Target and we have Amazon, right? And and all of them have a different target audience. And and in this case, uh, you know, certain consumers are going to want what I call certainty and convenience. Yep. But not all of them are going to want certainty and convenience. Some of them want to maximize their dollar the traditional way. And in this market, as you know. They can sell it traditionally pretty darn fast. Pretty darn fast. Yeah. Oh, that's terrific. Okay. Well, that's that's really cool stuff. So um, so as you're talking about um, you know, the agents taking advantage of like things like these tools, what are the what are the best agents, the, the best producing agents, the ones that get the highest like consumer ratings? What are those folks doing right now? Like what are what are some cool insights? I think first and foremost, what they're doing is they have worked on and they've developed an unshakable mindset. You see, it's easy for us to say we have a great mindset until it's tested. And over the last 22 months, every one of our mindsets have been tested and you either crack or you or you thrive, right? And so all of them that I know that are performing at a high level have really spent time and worked on an unshakable mindset, including Self-care, which include working hard, you know, uh, time off, uh, a balance where it's not 24-7 all the time. So once we see that, we go beyond that. Then the the, the trends I'm seeing is, and I'm going to use the word teams, but team could be defined in a lot of different ways. Team doesn't mean necessarily that you have buyer's agents and seller's agents. It could be that you have a number of assistants on your team that that help you leverage, but but the, the the concept of scaling, of being bigger than one individual person, mm-hmm. is a common trait among everyone. They're scaling beyond themselves because they know that single solo agent can only produce so much. A so system you- will produce what a system will produce. Nothing less, nothing more. If I have one salon chair, I can only produce so many salon things, right? Yeah. So do you? Um- do you see a big trend to teams, agents forming teams? Is that happening with JPRT agents? A- absolutely. And I have to be careful what we define a team. So, so I have a uh, an agent in, in our firm that's going to do 100 transactions this year. She has a team, but she has not one buyer's agent or one seller's agent. They're all individual administrative assistants who do certain functions. And they handle everything, which allows her to be uh, a major producer. Now, she's going to reach a limit. And, uh, you know, and then we have teams like, like people would think when we say the word teams, they have 10 buyers agents and listing agents. And so there's six different types of teams and six different types of team models. One of those might work, but all of them are something that everyone should consider. So there is every, every agent should consider building in one of those team types. Yeah, depending on your long term goals. But having, I, I use the analogy of a barber chair. If I'm a barber and I have one chair, I can only have a capacity. You only cut so many hairs, so much hair, yeah. 
Right. Now, if I add three or four more chairs, right, now I can do so much more. And, and so we have to start thinking scale. And all top producers that I'm working with are thinking, how can I scale my business to achieve the goals? Uh, you know, the beauty of this business is each and every one of us has a different goal. And the way you want to get to that goal could be differently. But, but the uh, the key is at the end of the day, you want to have a thriving business that one day, hopefully, when you retire, you can you can transfer to somebody else for for a monetary value. Yeah, that really is the one of the really elegant uh, things about the real estate industry. Uh, and people, uh, I hear people lament about how there's so many agents who don't sell very many homes. Um, and it always seems to me like that's probably okay that there are agents out here that don't sell homes. They sell a couple, but that's the that's the goal, the business they want to be in. Uh, and they they are licensed for one reason or another. And we happen to have, I think, uh, we, we have a record number of agents licensed right now. I think realtors licensed right now. We do. And, and we have too many agents chasing too few transactions. And that's why I started off with top of mind for me is double down, triple down. We're all going to have to work harder to get the same amount. Hustle mode on. Uh, one of our franchise owners is known as the Dean of Hustle. Yeah. You're not the Dean of Hustle in 2022. It is going to be a tough year. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit more about the future. So, um, you know, we are going into 2022 with probably record low inventory. Demand is still high. What else do you see for 2022? Well, you know, home prices, you know, obviously, you know, you know this better than anybody. When you have that limited supply and demand, Unless we see something significant interest rates, we're going to see you know some national housing prices continue to climb year over year increases uh, in housing prices. So affordability, uh, our national leaders and leaders at the local city and county level have to attack uh, affordability. Uh, and you know I just read an NAR report that that shows some of these commercial buildings and old outdated malls are being converted to multifamily and multi-use. So I think we're going to see some of these things, some creative uses of the land uh, uh, that are not going to be financially viable because there's just no inventory. Yeah. Um, and and um, so um, let's talk longer term then. So talk to me about the future of like, where do you see... Um, agents and brokerage and where does the consumer go like what does this look like um over the next several years well i i'm pretty bullish of the next three years i don't know if i can go beyond three years but the next three years as you can see at the current pace of building according to nar and some of the other economists it's going to take three years just to catch up and so i'm really bullish on that i, I think the, the power is going to go to those that are the most flexible. The power is going to go to those that, that have the most hyper-local expertise. The, the, the only competitive advantage we have right now is superior customer service. What's the experience like to work, let's say, with a JPAR agent, with your agent, with, with your company? If that experience isn't exceptional, the consumer is going to walk with their, with their feet and their dollars to someone that's going to deliver them a great experience. So yeah. we're working on in every aspect of our business, what's the experience like to work with us? And, and we we secret shop our own selves. Do you? Secret we shopper. Do. We secret shop at our own selves to say, okay, what was the experience it was like to join our firm? What was the experience like to work with one of our agents? And you know, feedback is the breakfast of champions. I think one of those old TV commercials from somebody was you know, the breakfast of champions. And so we get a lot of feedback uh, from, you know, secret shopping, from surveying our consumers and our agents and our, our key customers yep. and our business to business partners. You do that, that secret shopping starting at the lead conversion level, like when they first contact, because mm -hmm. that's of course and, always one of the complaints, right? It's like, you know, I, I, uh, I was on Zillow and I asked for, uh, you know, in, information and nobody ever called me back or, you know, somebody called me back 14 times and you know, <laughs> whatever the things are. Or where you call someone and the agent says, well, that's sold and they hang up the phone. Yeah. 
<laughs> right, right. right? So, well, yeah. <laughs> so wait, you just missed a great opportunity. You know, that one sold, but we might be able to find one like that. You know, what's important to you? And like one of the things we found, the leading indicator of closing an online lead is getting a first buyer consult, either getting them to agree to come to your office and, and do a buyer consult meeting or getting them to, to show a home and then do a buyer consult. Oh, got it. So, so like getting um, some type of first time meeting yep. is a leading indicator of whether you're going to do anything with that leader if it's just going to waste your time. Right. The the initial close is the close for the meeting, the first meeting close for the meeting, and, and we can when we secret shop folks, we can see those who have a skill at doing that and those who don't. It's a real skill. Yes. Um, and it's a skill that everyone listening can develop. Our good friend David Knox in the David Knox Library has an, an amazing module on, on how to address online leads and in video trainings and those kind of things. Cool. Th that's interesting. Um, uh, so let's let's talk a little bit more about the millennials then. So um, there's a bunch of them. They're more than more than more than boomers. Um, Seventy-one million, I believe. Yeah, and so th they've got things like there's, there's concerns about things like student debt and you know down payments. What do you think about you know those things in that demographic? Like, and and what should are the things that I should be paying or we should be paying attention to that you say will like uh, determine the success? Well, well, you know, we used to think these millennials were just going to drive around the country and take pictures of their food and their trips and post them on Instagram, right? But what we're finding is they're they're starting to settle in. They're they're uh, you know if they're blessed to have a a, a great job that gives them some good income, they're starting to settle down and uh, ha have families. Uh, I have three millennials. One just had uh, their first son. I now grandpa for the first time. That's great. And you know we're we're starting to see that. And and yeah, they're strapped by some student debt, and and, and that's an issue they have to get through. So they're delaying, like my three sons, delay, they're, they're a little later in buying their first home than I did. I, mean, I, I bought my first home almost six years earlier than they did. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because of the economic factors and, and some of these things. But so it, it took them a little longer to get there, but, but we're seeing it. Yeah. In my firm, I have five agents. Uh, I've got lots of millennials, but five of my millennial agents bought in October as well their first home. Amazing. So they're becoming products of the product. Uh, I have a pretty young brokerage. And like my average age in the brokerage is 40 years old versus the NAR average of 56. Yeah. Oh, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, so what do you attribute to that? Um, is there is there an attraction that they're they're looking for? Uh, uh, well, we started the firm uh, exclusively working out of uh, licensing schools and and attracting new agents that were maybe switching careers. Uh, or coming into the industry, uh, you know, from, you know, maybe their parents were agents or those kind of things. Uh huh. Uh, it just, uh, you know, I don't know if it was by design. It just happened to happen. It happened to be that way, and then you gain you gain some momentum with that space, and then it's a snowball. Oh. But but the the point is whether they're a real estate agent in your millennial, you need to be a product of the product. It's kind of hard to sell housing, and then someone says, "Well, where do you live?" Well, I rent over it. <laughs> you know, the apartment complex. Yeah. And you may have to start that way, obviously, but you want to become a product of the product. And uh, anyway, my, you know, I, I think they're, they're coming of age, they have the money uh, and, and they're wanting to, 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 to kind of settle down and not be so uh, nomadic. Yeah, for sure. And they, they, um, uh, I mean, it's been such a good deal to be a homeowner mm -hmm. over the last 15 years at, or, or you know, many more than that, but really the last 10 years have been so good uh, that it's it's hard to ignore that. Yeah, and you could probably speak to it better than I can, but if you go into an inflationary environment, which is probably where we're headed, uh, real estate has always done well in an inflation, inflationary market. Especially if you're, you know, if, if, it's get, if we get inflation that stays at five, six percent or more, and it, but your mortgage is locked in at 3%, forever like that that's an incredibly good deal i told a story um on our webinar last week of a friend who um had in la who um is 
planning for exactly that. And and he he said he's always been super conservative with debt, always had, you know, one to one cash for debt. And during the pandemic, he says, I see the inflation coming and I bought a two and a half million dollar house and because I want to pay back that loan in future dollars that have been inflated away. Um, and, and it's, uh, it's it, like, I understand his logic and it's, 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 um, I could see there are some risks to it because uh, if, uh, if the economy tanks and demand for the high end homes falls, he could be, he could be, um, you know, lose some value, but he, at the same time, he's still, he's got his home. He's locked in at this price that he can afford forever. And he could be paying it back in dollars that have been inflated away. I only wish I had the skill, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the fortitude to go do that kind of transaction. <laughs> you, know. Uh, you know, Mike, the other trend, and I don't know if you see these stats, but there is some migration going on in, in the United States. And some of it is, is logical, you know, people coming from cold winter states to warmer states and uh, you know, maybe the West Coast to the South and Central. But there are some some uh, states in uh, Massachusetts and Maine. Uh, Portland is one that is attracting quite a bit of net migration in. Huh. So there are some outliers uh, in uh, in Boise City, Idaho is is one that that, that is uh, seems to be attracting folks. You know, as well as the ones you would think, like short Charlotte, uh, South Carolina, and Jacksonville, Florida, and those kind of cities, but there are some in the Northeast and in the West. Yeah. Well, and, they, and I think a lot of them have, they have, um, uh, you know, affordability in common, especially if you're moving in the Northeast, if you're moving out of New York or Boston um, or, you know, in the West, you're moving from Boise to, from, from LA to Boise or LA to Phoenix, like everything feels super affordable uh, yeah. and you get a quality of life change yeah. too. Um, do you think the trends, the pandemic, some of that is driven by pandemic change, the, the work remote um, and, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the, the like no longer being tied to the city. Uh, we call them Zoom towns, right? You could, you could, uh, mm -hmm. you're Zooming remote. What do you think of, tell me what you think about those trends for their long term, any difference, what, anything you're seeing currently? Yeah, I think it's a long-term trend. We're finding that our productivity, in fact, didn't drop and our satisfaction of the employees went up because they now have a, a whole lot more flexibility. Like so you guys I, are, you guys aren't do, you're doing fewer offices. Well, now, now see, that's agent. Yeah. Now, there's a difference between W-2 staff and independent contractor agents. And I want to talk about that. So we're yeah. going to do some offices in 2022 for the agents, but but our agents use their their office in a different way than they used to. It's not like you're going out there to hang out. They're there to meet a client, get a contract signed, uh, get some work done, and they're out uh, on on the street pounding the pavement. But but the uh, corporate offices, the staff offices, have totally changed, and I think uh, potentially forever have changed, where the the employees. Uh, get a greater sense of satisfaction. They're having more productivity. Now they're losing some connectivity and there's ways you can do that through, let's say quarterly uh, meetings or monthly uh, meetings, or maybe you come into the office a couple of times a month kind of a thing. But So I think you're going to see that shift continue for a significant period of time. And you're in Dallas. Do yes. you, uh, and I'm in San Francisco, um, and, and of course, those two cities have had very different reactions to the pandemic mm -hmm. um, uh, in San Francisco. I'm starting to see, uh, you know, leases being signed, like corporate leases and, and getting a little more flow back uh, in the downtown areas. Um, it, what are you seeing in Dallas? Oh, absolutely. But, but what we're saying is, you know, maybe maybe you were looking to do your corporate headquarters at 10,000 square feet, and now you're going to do 5,000 square feet instead, and you're going to have some shared office space, almost like we work for your uh, employees that work from home to come in a couple times a week, maybe. Yeah. So it's changing the composition uh, of some of the commercial space. Definitely, we're seeing smaller versus bigger and more and, and reconfigured 
uh, in a different way that would accommodate both uh, day workers and uh, maybe uh, like in my corporate office, my, my accounting people need to be there every day and they want to be there every day. Yeah. Many of my other folks who do other tasks uh, you may only need to be there you know, once a month when we meet for a, for, for a meeting. Got it. And so you have a mixed, uh, you have a, a mixed uh, office attendance now. Yeah, yeah, we have a distributed workforce and a mixed attendance. And, and many of the CEOs and others I'm talking to inside and outside the industry are, are, are seeing many of the same trends. Yeah, interesting. Well, that's, that's super cool. Um, you know, it's, before we go, we should wrap up pretty soon here. But before we go, um, it, what's something that you're working on at JPAR that you're most excited about? Something you can share with us that, that um, to look forward to? Well, we're always working on something. We're a continuous improvement company, and, and uh, we look at every process in the company uh, inside out, and we secret shop ourselves. And so right now, we're working on our team process to make sure our team experience is as up-to-date, relevant, and smooth as, as it can be, whether that's onboarding a team or supporting a team uh, through their growth. So, so uh, that's one of them. One of them is really equipping our associates uh, to earn, gain, and market more listings. In 2022, is the, 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 the winners are going to be the doers in the listing game. Got it. Do you see uh, ability for JPAR to take market share? A absolutely. We, we can gain a bigger piece of a, maybe a smaller pie, you know, if the market shrinks a little bit with depending on where inventory goes, uh, we can absolutely gain a bigger piece. Um, you know, I don't know that that drives us. What, what drives us is the per person productivity and that's naturally going to lead to wherever that leads to. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so that's how you think about it is, is per agent productivity per agent per everything we think about is per agent productivity. That's great. And ha how do we help not only our agents and our firm grow uh, to be top producers in each of the markets that we represent? That's terrific. Um, so where can people go to find more about JPAR? And you mentioned the JPAR Sure Sales. So that's the, the product for sellers that allows yeah. them to see all the different options of, with all the, the yeah, financing they, things going on now? They can go to jparsuresale.com and they can go to our website, jpar.com and, and check us out and look at that. And of course, there's so many amazing brokers out there and broker owners who I respect all across uh, the, the country. Uh, you, you know, we're all in it to uh, serve the consumer, serve our agents and make a difference in our communities. And uh, th there's, it's just an amazing industry that I'm glad to be part of. That's great. Do you see um, that in the future or in this, like, do you see that consumers, do you feel like consumers are better served than they were 10 or 20 years ago with the latest trends being technology, being uh, financial things be, being, but it's still in the face of, you know, a shrinking available inventory. How, is the consumer I, better off now? I do believe they're better off and they're better off, particularly in states like Texas that have a pretty rigorous licensing and requirement uh, process to, to first even get your license. Uh, so some states like Texas have a pretty high barrier. And once you're licensed, you have to get ba basically the equivalent of your GRI and, and continuing education. Uh, some states still have a pretty low barrier. Maybe those consumers uh, aren't served as well. But I can tell you in Texas, the, the, the quality and the professionalism of agents is amazing. Uh, and with the technology and the training and everything that's out there today, uh, consumers uh, with a real estate professional uh, are in really, really good hands. Terrific. Where... Uh, where should people look for you on social media or other places? Yeah, they can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Just look up my name, uh, Mark Johnson, J. Parr. I'm on Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, you know, all, all of the uh, ones all the I do. I, I do a, a weekly blog on our jparr.com slash blog. And That's of course, great. you can find our weekly success superstar series on YouTube. That's terrific. And so uh, agents of all 
all stripes should check out the success superstars and you will occasionally see me there <laughs> yeah you're on, you're on there and you're gonna be on there again pretty soon yeah, i hope so i'm looking forward to that okay mark thank you so much for joining us on the top of mind podcast uh, you're welcome and and thanks for allowing me to contribute can't wait to contribute again in the future looking forward to it so thank you all for listening to the top of mind podcast uh, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any of the future episodes. Visit altosresearch.com to get local market reports for your area or schedule time with our team. Uh, there's plenty of links. We'll include links and details in the show notes for the show. So thanks again, everyone, and be well. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for listening to Top of Mind. See you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.